Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 9 in season 2 of Lawyer On Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today I'm joined by Laani Victoria Kidoles Venus, who is a legal director at Shusaku Yamamoto in Osaka, Japan. Shusaku Yamamoto was established in 1979 and is one of the largest and most highly regarded intellectual property and technology law firms in Japan. This firm is held out as being a reflection of its diverse group of legal professionals, composed of both Japanese lawyers and foreign attorneys admitted in the New York State, England and Wales, Australia, Singapore, Philippines and Indonesia. The firm currently handles the most number of filings for patent and trademark applications at the Japan Patent Office from clients based in the US. They have also been the patent filing firm in Japan for numerous Nobel Prize recipients. Lani was born and raised in the Philippines, attending Ateneo de Manila University to obtain her Bachelor of Arts in 2004 with a major in political science and a minor in philosophy. She graduated from the University of the Philippines with her Juris Doctor in Law in 2011. In 2012, she studied comparative laws on intellectual property at the Osaka Institute of Technology. In 2013, she graduated from a certificate course intellectual property law through the World Intellectual Property Office Academy. Lani is not one or two, but a triple qualified lawyer in the Philippines, attorney in New York State, and a solicitor of the Supreme Court in England and Wales. Lani's specialist practice areas include corporate governance, compliance, and data privacy compliance. She has also a demonstrated history of providing transactional and regulatory advice to various multinational companies in the food, pharmaceutical, and healthcare sectors. As a legal director of Shusaku Yamamoto, Lani manages a team of more than 60 lawyers, technology specialists, legal professionals, and assistants. She also manages IP portfolios, including those inventions of Nobel Prize winners I just mentioned, as well as the portfolios of blue chip Fortune 500 companies, national governments, globally renowned universities, research institutes and high net worth individuals. Lani is a terribly passionate volunteer in the community. She currently serves alongside me on the executive committee of Women in Law Japan. She is also actively involved in several programs for promoting the rights of foreign residents in Japan, being a really fierce advocate of women's rights and human rights and supporting activities aimed at closing the gender parity gap, particularly around education and employment in the legal field. She also volunteers for Know Your Rights Japan, an informal volunteer group which Lani herself founded in 2018. Know Your Rights Japan advocates for the protection and promotion of the individual rights of foreign residents in Japan. Well, the list keeps going because in 2019 and 20, Lani was one of the top five finalists for the Young Lawyer of the Year and one of the finalists in the BMW Women Lawyer of the Year Award in the ALB Japan Law Awards. Lani also manages to find time to teach at one of the top law universities in the Philippines, the University of Philippines, where she graduated from. And as you can tell from that introduction, Lani is certainly a lawyer extraordinaire, and I'm super pleased to bring Lani as my guest today on the podcast. Lani, welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for that really long introduction. I think you made it sound more prestigious than it really is. <laughs> well, no, that's you. That is you I've, <laughs> and all of you, which is really incredibly amazing. So, Lani, today we're going to be talking about your career path, 
how you navigated your studies in the Philippines and Japan, your current legal director role, and we'll also talk about your passions for advocacy for women, legal rights for foreigners, and I'd love you to offer up some gems of advice for young lawyers <laughs> on their career paths. How's that sound? That sounds amazing. I'd be sure to answer all of your questions as much as I can. I mean, with the limited time we have. That's so good. Thank you. And today we are talking online. In fact, you are in the Philippines and I am in New Zealand currently. Yeah, currently just out of quarantine and in stage two of my home isolation as we record this. But if we were going to be meeting up in person when we get back to Tokyo, do you have a favorite wine bar or cafe or restaurant you like to go to and what would you choose off the menu if there's one thing that i would probably meet you in i mean if we can travel maybe it's not even gonna be in tokyo maybe i'll bring you to my hometown oh yes thanks what are we gonna have so there's this place it's called red labuyo that's um the local dialect for red chili because our my hometown in Bicol we love spicy delicacies this restaurant is really good so it really goes well with wine and it's overlooking Mount Mayon which is like a perfect cone um volcano just like similar to Mount Fuji it's our version of Mount Fuji Wow, we also have a similar Mount Fuji in New Zealand called Mount Oh, Edmont. really? You do? Yeah. Also perfectly coned, right? Perfectly coned. It's actually where mm-hmm. they filmed The Last Samurai. And so they had to make The Last Samurai atmosphere look like early Japan. So they came to New Zealand and filmed it here. So Tom Cruise came and it was all lots of fun in New Zealand. So maybe next time they can go to your town and film. And then go to your town and then um, we can we can also have maybe we can also meet up near your town yes. and look at your mountain. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So what kind of wine do you have in Philippines? Do they make wine? Yes, actually, we do have our own version of um, sake. It's called lambanog, but instead of using rice, we use coconut. So um, that's a type of an alcoholic beverage made of coconut juice. So maybe you can have that. It's quite strong, though. Sounds um, intoxicating. If you're not a... <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. Wow, that's amazing. So Red Labuyo, we're going there. Yes, correct. Right. And um, in front of the Mount Mayon, we can have um, your wine with some spicy delicacies. Sounds so nice. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, Lani, I was trying to think back to when we officially met. And I think you reminded me that it was initially at the 2019 Women in Law Japan New Year's party. And then we had a few other opportunities to meet. And then we were were both nominated for Women of the Year Award in 2020. I think it was. Yes, that's right. And we came across paths again then. And but properly, I think our first sort of real conversations were about two years ago in January 2020, when we had the Women in Law XCOM meeting and you and I were both on the website and the comms committee. Is that right? Did I get it right? Correct. That's correct. Um, We were both, I think with um, Jessica, we were both in the website committee. And that's how the relationship actually grew because um, we would have regular meetings after that. But we first met in the Women in Law Japan New Year's party in 2019. That was before the pandemic. Right. Yes. The the good old days. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's true. When we did that website project, we also were able to talk a lot online, weren't we? And we talked about other things as well as the actual project. So it's a good way to get to know people. Correct. Before we dive into your career, let's go a little bit back to your early days. And I know you're sort of in your hometown now, so you're probably getting a lot of visions about what you were, you know, what you were like when you were a child and perhaps what you wanted to be when you were a child. I ask everyone this. So tell me. <laughs> Lani story. I actually did not end up where I wanted to be as a child. Even as a kid, I think I was a bit ambitious. I wanted to be the president of the Philippines back then. Oh, 
<laughs> really? Yes. Um, people oh would ask goodness. me when I was like five years old and I would say I want to be the president of the Philippines because I felt that although I have a lot of amazing and good memories as a child, when I was growing up, we really didn't exactly um, have a very comfortable life. I would even say that we were probably a little below the normal average family in the Philippines. One thing that I remember before, there was a time that our apartment as a family was padlocked because we couldn't pay for the rent. We were outside of the house and my mom, she was very fierce. She <laughs> shouted, I mean, I don't, I don't really promote this, but she shouted at the landlord to tell the landlord that they should let us in because I was, I think, about seven years old oh or eight my. years old then. So it was quite ambitious to think that you will be the president of the Philippines when you're coming from a very, very poor family. But that's when I was made aware that the disparity of wealth, it really can make a family or even a, an individual powerless. And that poverty is not just economic poverty, it's really poverty of opportunity. And so it was a very difficult thing growing up, but it also gave me some insights when I was growing up why I would want to be a lawyer and I would want to advocate for social justice and all these things. Oh, so it was really around seven, eight, nine, ten that you were thinking about law then, or you're still thinking about this presidency role, but this sort of opportunity, I suppose, to be exposed to such a horrendous treatment mm. that led you to be thinking about defending people's rights and becoming a lawyer? Actually, during that time, I still wanted to be a president. <laughs> right. But when I was already studying, I think it was around nine or 10 years old, you realize that the people who are put in power, at least here in the country, they really came from affluent families. And so that started my, that I think that was the reason why my dreams of going into politics weighed down. And my parents, um, my dad is a frustrated, was a frustrated lawyer. So mm. he was really pushing for me to do law. And I felt in law, you can do a lot of things. So that's when it started. I started thinking that maybe a legal career is something that's right for me. Oh, I see. So your dad was really a lawyer already and he pushed you. Actually, Catherine, my dad is a frustrated lawyer. It means he wanted to be a lawyer, but because of lack of opportunity, he never became one. So he wanted all his kids to like be professionals. So he wanted me to be a lawyer because he couldn't be one. Oh, I get it. So a frustrated lawyer and he yeah. really wanted, did your, did your other family members also become lawyers? Just you? No one. No, oh. just me. So in my family, at least in even um, in my mom's side, I was the first lawyer, I think for maybe... <laughs> forever i mean i can wow. think back as early as maybe four generations ago definitely in my mom's side i'm the first lawyer in my dad's side one of my uncles became a lawyer but he was killed early on there's a bit of um violence in, here in the philippines so yes. um he was early on so i never really got to meet him my mm. father wanted to be one but he never became one so mm, but he must be so proud of you I'm sure if he's alive now, he would be. Yeah. He's, mm. I still, you know, my dad's passed away too, but I always speak of him in present tense. So I'm sure yeah. your dad is shining down upon you. Wow, that is really yeah. amazing, Lani. I didn't know anything <laughs> about you in that respect. But before you went and studied law, were you working in another position or another few positions? And so law was effectively your second career? Yes, I started working when I was 16. Whoa. The only reason why I was able to, so my dad died when I was about 16 years old. Oh, I and see. when he died, I had to take like a bit of odd jobs. I had a scholarship. That's the reason why I was able to go to university in the Philippines. So Ateneo is one of the most expensive universities here. Mm. And I was only able to go there because of a scholarship. But of course, you have other expenses and I'm the eldest in the family. So I had to provide a bit of money and help my mom as well. 
So I was doing odd jobs while doing university. I was a tutor for math. I used to love math. I don't do math anymore now. I also would work during the summer, um, sell random things. So for instance, I would accompany my mom to sell soap, sell meat. So wow. those were during my university days. Um, during summer vacation, that's going to be my job. I was also a research assistant for a professor. And I continued working, even um, going to law school. In fact, I had a one-year gap from my pre-law degree to my law school, wherein I had two jobs. I was working two full-time jobs because one of my job I had to save for law school. I didn't get a scholarship anymore. Wow. So I would sleep for like, I think four or five hours a day for a whole year because I was trying to save money. My call center job, I would save my money um, from there. And then my job in the morning, which is an ad advertising association, I would contribute that to the family because two of my younger siblings, they were still studying then. So I was helping my mom a bit. I mean, my sisters were also all working when they were studying. So we all did chip in our share. Wow. I think you, you, your work ethic, for example, really fascinates me. And also, I think your, your story could be a movie. This is amazing, Lani. <laughs> you know, Catherine, you'd think that it's an amazing story that I, what I have now. But if you talk to many Filipinos, you would see that some of them, they just didn't have that opportunity to study. But if, if they were given that opportunity, they would probably have been able to turn their lives around. So yes. for instance, my mom. My mom, when she was growing up, she was also helping her parents and her siblings study. And my mom never graduated from university. She graduated from university the same time that I graduated from law school. So when she was finally able to do that, she felt like a really huge accomplishment. But all throughout her life, you'd see that the way that she turned things around for her, despite the lack of op opportunities, it's not something that's uncommon here. You'd see it everywhere. I have classmates who, are, who grew up, I think, even in a worse off situation than me. But because of the education that they had, they were really able to turn things around. When you say that you feel that my story is amazing, it's really not. I it mean... Could, yeah, it, I think it could it, be it, representative of many people, as you're saying, it but I, I still think, I just wonder where that tenacity, that power comes from to turn things around. How do you know you can turn it around? Sometimes, you know, when I look back, I think my turning point was getting that scholarship. I feel that if I did not get that scholarship, I would probably not be able, I will not be able to travel. I would not be able to take all these bar exams, nor meet you or meet <laughs> different amazing women yeah. um, in the field, if not for that first scholarship that I received. I think that was one of my turning points. And so I'm really thankful for the people who contributed so that I can have that scholarship. There's a lot of people who contribute to the Ateneo um, scholarship program. I think they do not appreciate how much impact they have on some of the students' lives. Like me, it, it was such a big impact that, I, that they had in my life. So I try, to, I try to do give back. I do have like small um, contributions to scholars as well because I know that it can really turn things around for that person. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And hopefully <laughs> there are people there who you can share this with and, and let them know, you know, through what you are telling us that you do appreciate them and that they need to know what they do has really changed your life. That is absolutely amazing. You've got me honestly goosebumps, you know, the chicken bumps as they call it. <laughs> in Japan, but that is amazing. And so you entered then the University of the Philippines to do law. After I was able to save up enough money, so I, I studied for a year. The tuition fee in 
University of the Philippines or UP as we call it. It's really cheap um, during my time. So one year of working in a call center or BPO industry, I was able to um, save up for the whole four years. Of course, I didn't have enough for my day-to-day, but enough already to um, sustain me for the next um, year. So I did that and then I was working at the same time. But I think when I was about to enter second year, no, 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 towards the end of my second year, I had a difficulty doing law school and working full time. It really was very difficult. I didn't have good grades. So I transitioned to an evening class, which is um, class meant for working people. And I stayed there until I graduated from university. Is it four years in the Philippines? Four years of law school in the Philippines, but for the evening class, it's actually five years. Goodness me, you also had the the drive to to do that. I think, was it the end goal that kept you going or what kept you going and your study at night and your working during the day? I wanted to provide for my family. I think that's one of my driving goals. And I felt that if I'm able to finish this and be a lawyer, It would even wherever I go, at least in the Philippines, you would have enough. You may not have a lot, but you would always have enough to support your family. And so I felt that that's something that I wanted. And of course, it's also my mom and my dad's wish for me to be a lawyer. So that also did push me. Mm, Do you think often about those days, I guess, especially now you're back in the home country, but do you think about those times often? Do they drive you now still in all that you do with your work and uh, your community work that you're doing? Well, it does. So, Catherine, yearly, I try to organize a project to try to give back. It doesn't necessarily have to be money. It's my time or I organize an event meant to help or propagate education. I think that that commitment that I have of a yearly social civic activity is really because of um, my background. I just plan on working until maybe I'm 50. And after that, I do want to have my own foundation. I want to have a business wherein 100% of the profit would go to education of kids. That's that's really my end goal. Wow. So right now, I'm trying to save as much as I can and invest so that I'll be able to carry out that goal because I wouldn't be here if they did not give me the opportunity to study. And I feel that if I provide that opportunity to other young women, especially young women in law, and those people would also try to do it for others, then it would really bring this world into at least a better place than it previously was in. So that's my main plan for my career and my life legacy. Have you told many people about this, that you want to do your own foundation? Yes. In the office, um, most of my, at least most of the lawyers that I work with directly, they know this. Most of my law school friends, because this did not start just now. In fact, I have one friend. She's working in Washington now. I made her commit to make sure that if I die early, she's going to do the foundation herself. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, I'm also thinking, you know, how can we help you within uh, our respective communities to help you through this and to get you there? That would be great to talk about with you. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. That would be amazing. Sometimes the lack of platform. And so I really felt that this is a good, a great opportunity to tell people out there that if they want to help, they can sponsor like there's a lot of organizations. They don't even have to wait for my foundation. There's a lot of organizations out there now trying to help kids or trying to educate kids. If you can, like, touch base with them. I try to find my own scholars because 
I have a priority, like I try to focus on those people in the lower economic spectrum. So like maybe bottom 20% of the Philippine population or women because... So our block right now, it was initiated by one of my blockmates in UP College of Law. They also sponsoring a scholar a woman student for UP College of Law. And so I think any of your listeners, if you can try to sponsor a kid, especially for their education, I know there's a lot of other basic needs like food, but if you can sponsor them in their education, that's, that, that, that can really go a long way. Sure can. Okay, well, if there are some foundations that are coming before you set up your foundation, then let us know. We can pop them in the show notes for people to have a, a reference to later on. That's of course, amazing. Of course. Yeah, it's a totally amazing, Lani. I'm so impressed. And so after you've been studying, um, let's carry on. You went into the Baker <laughs> McKenzie, is that right, for your first job as a lawyer? No, no, no. That no? was still when I was in law school. Right. Okay. So I... that was the job you were doing while you were studying. Yes, correct. That was my last year of law school. Uh, I was um, working for Baker and McKenzie. I continued doing that even after I graduated, until I took the bar exam. So here in the Philippines, once you graduate, you have about six months to prepare for the bar exam. And they put a lot of pressure in the bar exam and that you should pass it on your first take. I, I personally do not think that that's necessary. I feel that you should take it on your own time. But, you know, because of that pressure, I continued working until I think a month before the bar we're in after that I really filed a resignation because I needed to focus on my study and I would study for like 12 to 16 hours um, because I only had one month left for the bar exam and then the bar exam in the Philippines is four Sundays of I think maybe six hours of exam every Sunday Hmm. For one full month, yes, for one full month, six to, to eight hours, I think. So you're going to be just taking the exam the whole day for that Sunday, and it's four Sundays. With us, it was four Sundays of November. Right after I finished the bar exam, my savings um, during that time was already depleted. On the Monday after my last Sunday of the bar, I applied in Shisaku Yamamoto. Oh, really? So where did you see that job advertisement for Shusaku Yamamoto? I was actually looking for um, job opportunities who, which did not require you to be an admitted lawyer because I just took the bar. I'm not even sure if I was going to pass. And I had to wait, I think, until February of the next year before I would know if I passed or not. So I tried searching for opportunities for people with legal background, but without the certification yet. And I saw one posting for Shosaku Yamamoto, I think in an Australian website, if I'm not mistaken. So I just Google searched it and then that Australian website appeared. And then that was one of the postings there. They were looking for someone who graduated with a law degree, but does not necessarily have to have the certification. When I looked at their website, they had a few Filipino lawyers. And so when they actually hired me, they hired me, I think, after a month of interviews and different processes that I had to go through. After a month, they hired me as a legal assistant. So when they hired me in Shusaku Yamamoto, I was hired as a legal assistant. But before going to Japan, I had my certification. So in the Philippines, I, I got the good news that I passed. And so they changed the role into a foreign attorney or a foreign lawyer. And that's how it happened. So that's the wow. story. <laughs> Gosh, you know, this is it. Is You just need to look. Look beyond what you're thinking and things come to you. It was meant to be that you would have that position because you've now held it for, you've been with them since you arrived in Japan, right? When was Nine that? years, correct. Nine years. Yes. But I also thought you came here and studied a little bit in Japan when you were arrived as well. You know, in Japan, you have a five day summer holiday and then you have like a few days collected annual leave. So 
I did not take any leaves before for my first year. I collected all my holidays and studied in Osaka Institute of Technology. So at night, I would prepare the schoolwork because there's a bit of schoolwork before the face-to-face. And then we had like a two-week face-to-face training. So it was a hybrid online and face-to-face training that they had in Osaka Institute of Technology. I did that while I was working in Shisako Yamamoto already. Okay, so I'm hearing a repeat pattern here of you (laughs) being very diligent and using your spare time to be studying as well as working. And would you recommend that to other people or is it really something specific that you're able to do? in the firm now, I was one of the first people who, while working in Shusako Yamamoto, also took the New York bar and the UK bar. So I didn't really take a long, as you know, for Japanese companies, you can't really take a month off or a year off to prepare for the exam. I did that while working. I started in 2014 And then, as you've mentioned earlier, I I now have two certifications. When I started, I was one of the first, I think. But later on, like now, I would say there would be maybe four people in the firm who did that as well. Wow. Some of them from Australia, some of them from the Philippines, some of them successfully took the New York bar, some of them successfully took the QLTS to be a solicitor in England and Wales. So I wouldn't say that it's something that's special to me. And in fact, almost everyone that I work with, I try to encourage them to do the same thing because I I really don't think that I'm special. I feel that if you just tell other people how you did it, they can do it themselves as well. They would put their own um, flavor or their own style in doing it, but they would also be able to successfully do it. Yeah, it's that how you did it because they can see the out the outcome, but they can't Ooh. see how you did the process and letting them know and not holding on to that information, being really generous with that information and letting people know that it's totally possible but helping them get equipped to do the same thing. I think that's wonderful. I mean, that's what education and sharing our knowledge should be about. Correct. It's actually a way of equalizing things. If you try to hold on, and that's that's one thing I love about technology. It's a great equalizer. If you try to share your knowledge um, with people you work with, or even sometimes people from other countries, you just message them and tell them, or even get gather information. I, I also do that, Catherine. I would sometimes message people who was able to do something already and ask them how they did it. And so because I get those information from other people, even people I have not met, I just meet online. I try to share it with people I work with because it's just a really give and take kind of scenario. Right. And so how was it then back in the first few days that you arrived in Japan? Were you really (laughs) surprised? Because that was your first country to visit outside of the Philippines, correct? During law school, while working, I became a representative of the Philippines for a conference in Korea and a conference in Singapore. That's actually how I learned of um, the legal profession in other countries. And that's what started me in looking at the international practice. There's this association called um, Asian Law Students Association or ALSA. That's the conference that I attended when I was, I think, on my fourth year, maybe third year or fourth year of of law school. Okay, so Japan, though, was different to those other countries. Correct. So how was it when you arrived? You arrived into (laughs) Osaka, I guess. You came in through Kansai Airport and you you were at Osaka. How did you feel? What was your first things that you remember at that time? in uh, <laughs> in the Philippines, we're a tropical country. When I visited Korea, it was, I think, summer during that time. And Singapore also does not have winter. When I arrived, it was end of March, going to early April. 
and it was still super cold mm. and I have never experienced winter ever in my life. <laughs> and so I brought with me like thick jackets, but I actually never thought that there's also a proper shoe or footwear when it comes to winter. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had this really thin socks and I was wearing, um, I think, a doll shoes during that time when I was walking and dragging all my luggage because <laughs> it was effectively moving my whole life oh my from goodness. the Philippines to Japan. And I had probably 40 kilos of luggage with me and I was walking and I was thinking, oh, wow, my, I think I'm going to have a frostbite and my toes will just fall off because <laughs> it was super cold. That's one of the first things that I remember when I arrived in Japan, how cold it was. Mm. And Osaka is not even that cold. And did you have Japanese language or soon after that you learned some Japanese? I got a tutor, but I actually never, never became proficient when it comes to Japanese in the office. And even when communicating with clients, I generally use English. I think that's one of my goals in the next five years to become proficient in Japanese. Wow. Okay. I'll, I'll keep you accountable for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. You've been at Shusaku Yamamoto for a long time now. What's the culture like there? What keeps you there? And perhaps the one or two positives you'd take away from working in this Japan environment? I guess I would start off with saying that there's really no perfect place to work in. It would always have advantages and disadvantages. Anywhere you go, in the Philippines, in Japan, there would be things that you like and things that you don't like. But um, with me, even in my previous work, one of the things that I would always um, look at is the impact of my contribution. So the impact of my work. One of the biggest things I feel um, or the biggest reason why I'm staying in this company is I can see the impact of my work, not just on the pharmaceutical companies that you're helping, for instance, but directly to the patients. So, for instance, there's one matter that I handled wherein the biosimilar was able to be successfully launched because of our advice. And when that biosimilar was launched, it actually reduced the price of the drug to mm -hmm. one third of the mm. innovator drugs. And so when you try to look at it that way, when you try to look at the impact of your work, not just on your direct client, but on the greater society, you really have this passion for the work that you're doing. It's the same thing with the mentoring. I'm sure you know the mentoring work that we're doing in Women in Law Japan. You don't really have a huge pool of pairs, but if, you, if that mentoring relationship impacts both the mentor and the mentee, then they might be able to um, share whatever knowledge that they have in their own circle. And so I think one of the reasons that um, reasons why I'm staying in this firm is because most of the work that we're doing, it has impact on the lives of ordinary people. So for instance, when you try to limit or invalidate a patent, then a generic drug would probably be able to launch their product. And so that's going to be an access to a lot of the patients. So that's how I look at my work. And I think um, when you look at it that way, no work is too small for you to give everything that you have. Right. I'm hearing you. Impact of your work, because sometimes as lawyers, we just don't see that impact immediately or even long term. And that can be demotivating. But Correct. you're saying, yeah, you are actually seeing outcomes and the way it is impacting for good your clients and actually people that you're working with as well. So that's really important, isn't it, as part of being a, a lawyer, an attorney in this country? For instance, if your passion is helping everyone, with the work that you're doing, even if it's a commercial transaction, it may have an impact on the employees of your client. And so trying to do the best work that you can or trying to provide them with the best service, it 
impacts not just your clients directly. It can impact other people as well. Sure, I get that. So aside from what you've just said, are there any other parts of your work that you really love? I'm thinking oh. about those uh, Nobel Prize winners or the blue <laughs> chips or the, the individuals you look after. Is there something else there with your regulatory work or the kinds of areas you're in, cosmetics, consumer products, food and bev, those areas that really make you feel very excited about what you're doing? One of the things that I really like is when we provide regulatory advice, for instance, um, for example, in labeling. And then the advice that you were giving, then you will see the product on the shelf. Oh, yes. That's one, that's one of the things that I'm really, really happy about. So at first, um, of course, they won't launch the product yet. And so you will give them the labeling advice, etc. And then sometimes you would see that the, the specific labeling advice that you provided them when, when they launch the product, you will see that there's a difference in the packaging because of what you've provided them. So that's really something that I also like. Sometimes I would actually like uh, take photos of it. For, I mean, to <laughs> remind me when you look, when you look back, when you look back on your phone, obviously I can't really post it, especially if it's a confidential matter. Um, but when I look back on my phone, I would see, I would be able to compare it with the with the advice that I provided, and I would think, oh, they they listened to this part of the advice. So that's something that's exciting, and I don't feel that a lot of people or a lot of lawyers do that. That's one thing I really love about the field of work that I'm in. I also like the impact, again, as I said, on the patients. I love learning about new technology. You know, the reason why IP is so amazing is because it's not just law. Sometimes law, after five years of practice, the learning plateaus. But with IP, even with design, you would see how the technology moves. And sometimes when it comes to technology, law. It's the law that tries to keep up with the technology. It's, it's the technology which dictates how the legal landscape would be shaped. And that's one thing I love about it. It's always exciting. You always see what's going to happen in the market before anybody else sees it. So that's one thing I love about the, about the work. Oh, it's great. And what's your future <laughs> dream for your role then? I can hear the joy in your voice. So what is... <laughs> Your future dream? Of course, there will be restrictions on how um, this will be implemented. But for the legal career, I really would want to see more women lawyers in our firm. Not mm -hmm. just um, foreign women lawyers, because we already have a lot. I also want to see more Japanese um, women lawyers. And I do hope that that happens soon. In Japan, I would love to see more women lawyers in the meeting room. So usually when you have meetings with counterparties, when you're negotiating, you don't see a lot of women lawyers. Mm. And I really hope that that would soon change. And there are a lot of um, initiatives to make sure that that happens. But I do hope that it happens faster. Wow, yes, I, I'm totally there with you. And maybe some people hearing this would love to be working with you, foreign women and also Japanese women lawyers coming along and being alongside you. I think they'd have a lovely time at the firm with you there. So Lani, your routine, I'm going to move to your routine and the, some of the things that you do to get yourself started in the morning to set off on the right foot and how you wind up your day. So usually I start off around maybe 6.30 to 7, I, I wake up, then I need a coffee. <laughs> two cups of coffee before I get moving. You're the same as me. So, I'm a two-cup coffee person as well. <laughs> I think it also um, gives you the time to relax, like God, gather yourself before jumping off to the day. Um, that's one thing that I like. And my partner, he likes putting in background music. So for my two cups of coffee, I have a background music. Lovely. Then I get ready. I get ready for work. I try to 
uh, maybe limit my time if I can to 15 to 20 minutes to get ready. But usually I end up preparing for like 30 minutes. So by around um, quarter to eight, I'd be out the door. And I usually, I don't do exercise. I think I've mentioned this before, Catherine. You have, you have. <laughs> but, but I actually work, walk from my place to my place of work which is about a 20, 25 minute walk. So that's, that's my exercise. Good. Um, that's good. I cross the bridge to get to my place of work. So I walk for about 20 to 25 minutes. Then I start off my day. Um, that's my regular schedule. Then of course, our normal work hours now because of the pandemic starts at 10. But I try to start a bit earlier than everyone else because once everyone else is there, you, there are questions that pop up that you have to deal with. But if I start a bit earlier than everyone else, I can prepare my day and even deal with the things that I need to deal with Um especially prioritizing because I think that's one of the important things that you need to know how to do. It's to prioritize what you should do first and second as the day goes by. So I would come in about an hour to an hour and a half earlier than everyone else. Then 10 o'clock, it's the normal normal work day. That would last until around 7 then things would die down around 8 p.m. And I would, if it's a normal day, by 8 o'clock, I'd be going home. And then I try to have dinner with my partner, then um, watch a bit of movie or watch a bit of a show. And then we, we'd go to bed. That's how my day would look like. <laughs> it's a pretty long day, but yeah. It I is, get, it is. I do understand that getting ahead of the the day right getting your edge on the day by doing your own bits and pieces that you need to do before the official starting time i think that's probably key to being successful and what you're doing. correct i actually feel bad today that i was not able to do that earlier because usually i try to be um a little bit like a, a little bit ahead but because of the internet connection <laughs> <laughs> I had a bit of a trouble connecting. I'm sure you'll make up for it during the week or the month. It's it's awesome. And also, Lani, I know you're very modest, but you're just a shining star in the law and you've won lots of awards and you've had publications where you've put out some interesting articles. There was one on the Hatch-Waxman Act, you know, the federal law on manufacturing Correct, yes. drugs. You've also won several awards and been in Chambers and Partners. What is it about you and awards and accolades? You seem to be really d driven person, you know, driven personality. You're motivated by achievement, I think, and recognition. Or is it just that these things are coming to you because you've kept your head down and you've really worked hard and they've come to you? Honestly, I think it is supposed to be a balance. After all, you still need to make sure that, especially for the firm, this is not really for me. So I sometimes do things for the firm, for us to be recognized in certain areas of law. I think it should be a balance, but the first thing that you should prioritize is really doing the good work. Because if you do not have that good work or excellent work put in, it, you're not really going to be recognized anyway. But eventually, after you put in the good quality work, like excellent quality work, then you have to also try to submit your matters in the legal directories so that other people would be aware of the good work that you're doing. Because, you know, now with the technology and with the internet access available to everyone, there's just so much noise out there. You have to learn to show that, okay, our firm is good in this particular field. So I, I, I think it should be a balance of mm. first doing the work. Right. And there's really no shortcut to it. I think you should do the work for a few years, excellent work for a few years first before trying to join those submissions. Oh, I see. Mm, okay, that's good advice. And then you've also, on the other side of you, you've got this volunteer work that you're doing. And maybe it's branding, but I don't think it is. I feel more to me like it's a passion, as you said earlier, to give back to the civic and social community. And I know you've obviously got your activities on women in law 
uh, Japan and you've been extremely active in the mentoring group. But I only recently got to know about your volunteer work with the Know Your Rights Japan group, which you yourself established. Can you tell me the trigger for establishing that and who's in the group and what activities you do and how this community of Lawyer On Air may be able to help you? We're a very small group. In fact, most of the volunteers come from um, people in the office because, as you know, the office, there's a lot of foreigners there. Um, the reason why we, we organized this group is because there's a lot of misinformation regarding employees' um, rights especially mm. foreign employees' rights in Japan, foreign residents in Japan. And so we felt that this is how it started, actually. We felt that we needed to educate foreign residents in Osaka about their legal rights. And so what we did was we invited a few lawyers and a union in Osaka um, there's a general union in Osaka who also volunteered and we provided, it's not really a legal advice, but it's more of a seminar. It was a face-to-face -face then. I think we had about 50 people who attended um, the event and they would ask questions. And what we did was we also got interpreters from different countries so that if someone doesn't speak English or Japanese, then they can ask their question through the interpreter and the interpreter would ask the lawyer. So that was the setup. I think um, it lasted for maybe an hour or two hours. That's how it started. The event happened in 2019, I think, early 2019. The 2020 event, the pandemic happened. And so we had um, just information dissemination and some people would contact us um, if they're having, actually, it, the type of work. It originally started with employees' questions, but now we've been receiving requests in relation to domestic violence, even kidnapping. And so what we do generally is we just try to connect them to the correct NGO who can help them because we really don't have the capacity to handle, handle those types of things. So we try to connect them to the General Union for Labor Matters, or there's this group called the Renegade. It's an NGO in Osaka, and they tend to help people if they're having trouble with domestic trouble, like filing reports to the police, and they don't have the capacity to communicate in Japanese. So the Renegade community is also helping us with that. So um, the work that we're doing in Know Your Rights is more of a middleman and just connecting them to the correct organizations. Mm, but let's get some more information about these out there. And so let's put some in the show notes today, but also through Women Law Japan, I can see us putting a site where we can have people come and find all this information as well and help you in some way uh, to make sure that people do know where to go, because that's the hardest thing Correct. is finding out. And recently we've had a lot of inquiries to Women in Law Japan about similar uh, questions. And I think it would be good to compile them all together and have a resource that people can go to uh, using and helping Know Your Rights Japan as well. Thank you so much for that. It's just amazing and wonderful work that you're doing there too. That's actually a great idea, Catherine. I think so right now we're mostly catering for people in Osaka, um, but putting it in the Women in Law Japan website would probably help more people and would probably cover more scope. Mm, I think so. And so let's try and do that. Well, Lani, I'd love to ask you for your advice for young lawyers, because you're, you're not an old lawyer yourself. You're a young lawyer in my book. And I'd love to know the things that you would be able to tell other young lawyers as they're coming up now. Are they supposed to do technology? Are they meant to be volunteering and networking? Are they meant to be doing all kinds of other things? What do you think would be really good advice, wisdom for young lawyers and law students coming out and starting their careers? I think you will never go wrong with having grit, really. That's one thing that should be learned even before you become a lawyer. Like growing up, it's something that 
uh, a person should have. I read somewhere that grit is a combination of passion and perseverance. And for me, it the, the, the passion there is not doing something that you're already passionate about. It's developing passion for the work that you're going to do. So for young lawyers, you should learn to have passion on the matters that you're handling, passion for your clients, passion for your specific um, matters. Because some people, they don't have the luxury of following their passion. And so if you end up doing legal work, for instance, you should um, try to be passionate about the work that you're doing. I would also probably say that when you're doing your work, you have to be thoughtful and know the impact of your action because that's really, or impact of your contribution. That's really something I feel that helped me care more about the things that I'm doing. And I guess finally, I would say make sure that you have time also for yourself. I mean, you have to take care of yourself even though you're trying to be more compassionate or be more passionate about the work that you're doing. You should always have a time to take care of yourself as well. Mm, Great, great tips. And I know as we're stepping into 2022, Lani, there are also many things that you'll be thinking about for your 2022. And if you have some more tips and advice for inspiring lawyers as they plan their career and personal development activities in 2022 what would they be these can be any kinds of lawyers lawyers at our level who are mid-career maybe even those who are beyond us who've got more years ahead of us what would you think would be things to be thinking about in 2022 always try to find a new skill to learn there's so much, so many things out there, so many skills to learn, which would not just help you in your career, but also help you in your life. So like for me, for 2022, I really do want to start taking my Japanese lessons seriously. I feel that it's going to improve my life in Japan as well as my career. So if there's one thing that I would tell, not just Younger lawyers or lawyers in my level or even people who are um, towards the end of their careers or actually not even lawyers. Learning a new skill is always to your advantage, I feel, and to the advantage of the community around you. Brilliant. That's brilliant. And Lani, is there anything else that we didn't cover today that you wanted to mention or that you did talk about but want to re-emphasize? If people from the California Alumni Association is listening right now, um, they're one of the people who chose me as their scholar when I was in university. I really do want to express my gratitude to them. That's, That's one thing that I feel I should specifically mention. I'm not sure if that organization still exists now because that was maybe 15, 16 years ago, but I I just want to express my gratitude to them. Lovely. Let's find out and we'll find out if people are still around from that organization and let them know that you've been on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Well, Lani, we're going to finish up with the uh, (laughs) super final super six which is a quick fire round of six questions that i love to ask every guest for winding up the interview and so the first question is if i had a million yen in cash to give you where would you spend it it can be philippines as well or japan your favorite store or destination or maybe it's a social cause in your case i would get maybe 10 scholars um for university whatever they want to study, and I would sponsor them until they graduate university. Wow, yes, I knew that was coming. (laughs) (laughs) All right, how about a a book or a podcast that you are listening to or have read or listened to recently that you could recommend? I don't really have uh, like a staple podcast that I listen to, although I have been listening to yours, but um, <laughs> usually to say in the back, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I've been listening to yours. Um, one of the amazing things for me was Aramides, and I also love Mindy's. In the background, I love listening to political comedians. So 
I like listening to John Oliver, so I just put him in the background. It's not actually a podcast because there's a video there, but I treat it like a podcast. I just put him in my pocket and then, I mean, I put the phone in my pocket and I just listen to what he has to say. So nice. um, <laughs> yeah. that's one thing that I, I listen to generally when I'm walking. But otherwise, more I, I listen more to music, especially mm. musicals. Mm, musicals. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. What yeah. about a favorite saying that you have, a mantra or something that you live by? I would say that it's that luck is defined when perseverance meets opportunity. Mm. Or no, no, no. It's actually preparation meets opportunity. Preparation luck is defined... Yes, yeah. as when preparation meets opportunity. I believe that. Mm, There's no like, such thing as luck. Mm, that's very deep. <laughs> <laughs> and Lani, is there a famous person or celebrity you would love to meet or have already met? I would love to meet Michelle Obama. Oh, yes. yes. I would love to meet her. There's a lot of things about her that I would love to learn from. So... Actually, for the holiday break, I'm going to be reading Becoming for winter Good. break. I was going to ask <laughs> you if you read, read it? it. Yes, I did read it uh, at the beginning of last year, 2020. I did read it um, just as we started the pandemic. It's absolutely amazing. You're going to love it. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. The thing is you hear her voice in your head as you're reading it. If you imagine oh, her really? voice saying the words. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And I think she does oh, have wow. an audio book as well. So you can hear her read those words to you as well. It's such an amazing thing. I know the history that they had. And for me, it's such an amazing thing, the way that she developed into... She's also a success. She's a success story. So I love hearing about people who you just do not expect becoming something that big. And it's... Breaking the, the glass ceiling, I guess. I would love for her to be the president of the United States. I know that she's really not into politics and she does not want that role. So, But I do hope that eventually she reconsiders it. Mm, that would be amazing. Amazing. All right. I'm going to ask you what's on your bedside cabinet in your house that inspires you and why. In my house in Japan, I would have the book of Adam Spencer. It's called The Big Book of Numbers. As I said before, I love the math. And so now I'm slowly reading that. What he does is he would count from 1 to 100 and provide you with interesting trivia about a specific number. So it's something that I'm, I really enjoy reading. It's my nerdy passion. <laughs> Sounds fun, actually. Even though I'm not a math person, it sounds like lots of fun. And the last question, Lani, I think we may be at six now, is the thing that's about you that people don't know. You've told me a little bit today about you that I didn't know, but something about you that a lot of people do not know about you. The one thing that not a lot of people know about me was when my dad... Um, passed away, he was actually misdiagnosed. And when I was studying law, I realized that the, diag the misdiagnosis, the case for that, already prescribed. And this is one thing that not a lot of people know about my history. And so I feel that the reason why I wanted to share this is this is for all the lawyers out there. If you can spare a bit of time to talk to some um, people needing legal help, I would really love it if you um, spend time with them because it can change their lives. So that's one thing that not a lot of people know that... Um, the action prescribed because I was not able to reach out to any um, lawyer with a capacity to advise me properly on that matter. Mm, goodness me. I think that's good advice to be leaving us with on the podcast <laughs> today. Thank you, Lani. Well, we have come to the end. Unfortunately, you really have had such a solid career 
niching down or niching down as our US friends say in IP law and compliance and regulatory and it's very clear that you are leveraging this amazing vivacious personality in your culture and experience and this background to give back to the community and all of these social and civic responsibilities and activities you've had in the community. You've really shared us an amazing story today with your insights and nuggets of advice. And it was so great to connect with you in this way. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, for having me. You know, um, I don't think I say this often, but you really are an inspiration. I mean, I would want to hear more about how you um, developed your career, especially how you decided to be an entrepreneur in Japan. I mean... I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, how <laughs> women, well, at least before, treated us a second-class citizen in this country. I will tell you that another day. So, <laughs> yes. Lani, how can our Legal Eagle listeners and other aspiring lawyer extraordinaires like you connect with you? Would that be on LinkedIn or is there another social media way to get hold of you? Yes, that would be in LinkedIn. Um, they can just drop a message. I generally check that. So Good. usually it's in LinkedIn. Okay. Well, fantastic. We'll put that in the show notes. And so anyone who's interested in connecting with you can reach out to you. Correct. Great. Well, I'll finish up there. We've had a fantastic conversation about so many different things. I'm really grateful to you for being my ninth guest in this season two of Lawyer On Air. And I want to thank you for your honesty and openness. It's been really amazing to listen with you. Um, thank you and, very much, yeah. Catherine. And so to all my listeners, please do like this episode and subscribe to Lawyer On Air and do drop us a short review as that really helps Lawyer On Air be seen by many people. You can also go to my webpage and leave me a voicemail and tell us what you thought about the episode and the guests that we spoke with. So do go ahead, share this episode with another legal eagle and someone who you think will enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer extraordinaire life. That's all for now. See you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.